Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of our sessions this week of the joint events between the Institute of Quarrying and the Institute of Asphalt Technology, covering achieving net zero across the week. So we've got a session like this every day at lunchtime for about an hour with a range of speakers covering a number of different topics under the banner of sustainability. I think today is very much kicking that off and starting with the macro view, if you like, of, of some of the issues around climate change and then how that relates to our sector specifically. I'm particularly pleased that we're joined by three presenters today. We have Kirsten Henson, who is going to be our keynote speaker. Also, uh, Brian Downs, who's the president of the Institute of Asphalt Technology, and Martin Riley, the president of the Institute of Quarrying. So moving on. So Kirsten's here with us. So I'll just give you a bit of a background on Kirsten. So Kirsten's worked for over 20 years in the sustainability field, uh, working with organisations developing master plans, corporate strategies and implementing sustainability innovations. A couple of the highlights from her career, working on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park for the London Olympics 2012 and the Innocent Drink Company's Net Zero Factory. Kirsten is also a co-convener of the University of Cambridge's recently uh, landed course in sustainable real estate and holds two master's degrees for the, from the University of Cambridge in engineering and engineering for sustainable development. I think you'll agree that's a pretty impressive CV and a great opportunity to have somebody can really set the scene for us in terms of some of the issues that we all face both societally but also for the industry. So without further ado, I'll hand you to the interesting person, which is Kirsten, and, and let you take it from here. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Thanks for the kind introduction as well. Yeah, probably been in sustainability for more years than I, I care to admit. But really, uh, you know, studied engineering initially and then was introduced to this concept of engineering for sustainable development. And it really just lit a fire in me. I didn't know what I was doing at university. I didn't really sort of get the idea why was I studying engineering, etc. And this opportunity really presented itself. And I think that's something to say for engaging a more diverse workforce, for bringing younger people into the workforce as well. You know, this this topic of sustainability really is one that seems to inspire and drive the younger generation now. So I'm going to sort of go from macro, if you like, you know, a bit of why are we talking about carbon, climate, sustainability. Most of you, I hope, will know this stuff, particularly with COP26 kicking off today. There's obviously been a lot of comms and focus on, on COP26 up in, up in Glasgow. But I think there's always, it's always nice to have a summary and just sort of I've tried to pick out some of the key messages around the sort of carbon and, and climate and sustainability. Then we'll move on to a closer look at the built environment and where next for quarried products, really. Literally the building stone of society, if you like. So um, if we are to develop and grow sustainably, um, the quarried product industry is absolutely a major, major part of that. And just for those of you that are really keen, you'll find, you know, this is a little, little quiz for you. Who recognises the quarries? I just picked these off the internet, but there's there's three quarries. I've been fair. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, I don't know. Whether, I don't think there's any prizes. But if you can recognise the quarries that I've, I've, I've picked, that would be uh, great to hear. So, you know, why, why all this talk about carbon? If you have a look, this is a, a slightly lighthearted approach about where we are at the moment in terms of climate change. And, and we've seen about 0.7 degrees see increase in, in global temperatures uh, since uh, since sort of records and we tend to talk about the industrial revolution because that's really where carbon emissions sort of skyrocketed in in 2015 at cop 21 the paris agreement that a lot of people refer to that is when the globe came together and sort of said actually yeah we're committing to holding climate change to within two degrees and aspirationally to within that 1.5 degrees that everybody is now really talking about, because I think we've got more information that says two degrees is going to create a really uncomfortable, difficult society. 1.5 is a much, much safer place for us to be. You can see here, you know, the suggestion, and this was based on the previous emissions gap report from the United Nations. They just released one last week, and I'll give you the update. So they were saying to us, last, last emissions gap report sort of said, you know, we need to be at net zero emissions by 2050 to stay within that 1.5 degrees. Unfortunately, the new emissions gap report suggests that if we get to net zero by 2050, we're going to experience a 2.2 degree rise. So it's getting pretty serious. You know, the suggestion is that net zero by mid-century leads us to a really uncomfortable 
and challenging environment to live. Most countries have sort of signed up to net zero by mid-century. China, US, other con- countries have pledged to do so. No clear plans, no clear strategy to get there. And we're seeing that with a lot of companies and a lot of cities. You know, they've all signed their climate pledges. Every single company is coming out with a net zero strategy. But what is behind that? Where is the data that generally says we know how to get to net zero? It's more than just words. It's more than just greenwashing. We're seeing country level greenwashing at the moment and a lack of commitment. And we're seeing that all the way through from out to our cities and companies as well. So, you know, just simply going out there and stating net zero isn't going to be the right way to do it. Many of the strategies as well rely on um, nascent technologies like carbon capture and storage, blue hydrogen. These technologies just aren't going to be there and aren't scalable in time to get us to uh, where we need to be by 2030, really. So, and the challenge is is, is really this. Um, if you have a look here, even if we even if we meet those current pledges and targets, we're still going to get to about 2.7 degrees rise, according to the new emissions gap report. The policies and targets have sort of got a little bit more ambitious and a little bit tighter. You can see that it was up at five degrees with the previous emissions gap report. We're looking at 2.7. So this is why COP in Glasgow this year is so essential. It's not just about creating more commitments, greater ambition, better commitments, but it's actually taking action as well. I mean, this is the, you know, Greta says no more blah, blah. And this is really serious now. We have to take action. The commitments aren't strong enough yet, but the fact is we spent the last couple of decades just blah, blah blahing rather than actually taking serious action. And the fact is if we hit 2.7 degrees, you know, if we really don't sort of solve this at COP, on a, on a global basis, if companies don't take their responsibility on a global basis, what does 2.7 degrees actually look like? Well, the Amazon turns into savannah, irreversibly, probably. Bleaching of corals, major valuable ecosystem. To be honest, the ecosystem, that ecosystem is, is unlikely to survive a 1.5 degree warming. We'd, we'd expect 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs to be lost if we if, even if we manage to keep temperature change within 1.5 degrees we hit to 2.7 it just disappears completely and i hope um, you, you appreciate that coral reefs aren't just pretty for the do- divers among us but actually the amount of biodiversity and marine biodiversity fisheries food sources carbon sequestration ecosystem services that coral reefs um, offer us are, are absolutely massive so we lose not just the sort of the biodiversity but actually food carbon sequestration etc um, that comes through coral we lose seafood because of the ocean it starts to acidify and that prevents crustaceans actually making their shells so there's not going to be any more seafood for anybody viable agricultural land will move m- northwards and we'll lose about 15% of our biodiversity across the globe. There'll be a doubling of the water deficit leading to droughts. And that combined with ocean sea level rise, you can understand that we'll experience mass migration. And, and people always sort of say, well, yeah, but we'll be OK. The fact is that mass migration, if you think about it, we're all going to have to live further away from the equator. So mass migration is going to um, impact every single community on this planet as people, it's not just war, it's drought, it's famine, it's a lack of viable jobs will be as a result of climate change. And climate refugees aren't just Pacific Islanders. The US has its own own homegrown climate refugees already. There's an area in Louisiana, which is no longer habitable, and the local population has had to move northwards simply because they've been flooded out. So this is happening and this is real now. And to pour, I think to pour fuel onto our burning planet, the problem is that many governments and companies are delaying serious actions until 2030. And that's a problem because it's not just about the end goal of net zero, but it's actually about how we get there. So, you know, we have what you might call an overall carbon budget. We have an amount of carbon that we can release in our, as we find our way towards net zero, where our emission releases are balanced by uh, what the ecosystem services are, are sequestering and, and any of these nascent technologies come forward in terms of carbon capture and storage, etc. 
but if you look at this, uh, and I hope it's a, a fairly straightforward graph, you know, I've sort of sketched out your available carbon budget getting us to net zero by 2050. If you think about this purple line, great, I've hit net zero carbon at 2050, but I've completely exploded my carbon budget. So I'm going to experience runaway climate change. Interesting, the line that we sketched out in, in red probably just about sort of aligns the, the, the nationally determined contributions across, across the globe with uh, carbon reductions. The, the emissions gap report actually sort of suggests that the pledges currently around government only take about 7.5% off the predicted 2030 emissions. So you can see that by 2050, it's kind of we're leaving it rather late if we only get to that 7.5 sort of reductions we need to be hitting 60 percent reductions in co2 emissions against 1990 levels to to to, to limit the gro global warming by 1.5 degrees so that's more like this green line here that you see yeah we might not get to net zero but until 2100 the end of the century but we've made massive cuts in our carbon emissions immediately as in in the next seven years this is not 2030 it's 2021 guys you know this is all in all in our lifetimes and very real lifetimes now so we need to have deep and drastic cuts in carbon 60 percent reductions in the next seven years to have a hope in hell of saying staying with 1.5 degrees so this means you know everybody has a task to play now personally professionally every single company across the globe if we'd acted on climate change 20 30 years ago when the governments were starting to talk about it as research was starting to come in we might have have a bit more leeway but we have for want of a better expression pissed all our time up the wall we really have left ourselves in a really difficult situation so it's time to take it seriously guys it's time to invest because quite simply, there is no world, there's no business left if we don't. And that's, I think, really quite real when you see just quite how extreme some of the impacts of, of going beyond 1.5 to 2 or 2.7 degrees rise. And of course, it's, it's, you know, it isn't just about carbon. Let's have a look at something called Earth Overshoot Day. And I'm hoping that this is something that you're familiar with. And apart from the little COVID 2020 blip, what you'll see is that generally Earth Overshoot Day is, is getting earlier and earlier and earlier every single year and what earth overshoot days tries to say is right we have a supply biologically productive land and sea forest grazing cropland fishing grounds all of the ecosystem services that they provide around food carbon sequestration chemical regeneration you know the nitrogen cycle phosphorus cycle all of these sorts of natural cycles that we see water water purification as well and of course we have a demand side we've got plant-based foods and fibers livestock fish timber other forest products space for infrastructure so land use change forest for carbon absorption etc and what what this is saying is that each year we are consuming more and more of the annually renewable resources available to us we are overshooting the earth's capacity to create a sustainable balance, if you like. And basically what this is saying is that we need 1.7 Earths to feed ourselves and to, to, to continue uh, our lifestyles as, as, as we expect, but that's a global lifestyle. If we all wanted to live, if the world aspired to living and having the same lifestyle as we do in the UK, we'd need about three planets. If we all lived like we did in the US, probably about five or six planets. So everybody has a part to play here. Meanwhile, you know, if you look at India, India probably are using about one third of their planet resources. Now, interestingly, about 57% of the human ecological footprint is carbon, and the rest of the deficit is associated with demand for products like food and materials outstripping the regenerative supply of those materials. So that's Earth Overshoot Day. The other interesting area, I think, is around planetary boundaries. Now, these were sort of proposed by Earth scientists in, in 2009 with a bit of a framework update in 2015. The update included novel entities, single use plastics being a key one, microplastics, uh, stuff that we create that the 
ecosystem can't assimilate and treat and break down naturally and some of the atmospheric loading those those items that are shown here is not yet quantified we're sort of in the updates and basically what the planetary boundaries tell us is of these core systems where are we in terms of zone of uncertainty have we pushed these core systems, these earth systems so far, these boundaries so far that we don't know what happens next. And you can see biosphere integrity. I know you've got a session on biodiversity coming up. The fact is that is already in red. We have we have seen such massive reductions in biodiversity across the globe that we are already beyond the zone of uncertainty. We have no idea what's happening. I think realistically, if we saw this graph update, we'd probably see ch climate change really pushing into that red now, you know, particularly with the new IPCC reports coming out, the code red that was issued. You can see the bio geochemical flow. So this is the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle. A lot of that is to do with water treatment and wastewater treatment. So where we're using fertilizers for growth, where we're, we're using chemicals and products in the production of goods and actually sort of essentially discharging polluted water into the ecosystem we, we've not got the balance we, we're really sort of starting to see uh, that tip as well now this isn't all bad news okay let's have a look at for example actually before I go on to the good news the novel the novel entities is a really interesting one you know everybody's talking about single-use plastics um, this is more probably about a personal lifestyle choice rather than um, well, there's probably things that you can do within industry as well. There's a lot of plastic wrap going on pallets when you, you know, you're, you, you're loading bags of ready mixed concrete or cement, etc. For the for the smaller consumers. But there was a report out recently that suggests microplastics are so prevalent that every single one of us consumes the equivalent of a credit card in plastic every single year. They're in our water. They're in our food. They're everywhere now. So I think if we do start quantifying these novel entities, we'll find that we are going to the point of high risk, a huge zone of uncertainty. We don't really know what the impact is going to be on our, our livelihoods, on the environment um, with this plastic prolification that we have going on. But as I say, it's not all doom and gloom. Have a look at ozone depletion. Little green bar. Now, if you're my age, in the sort of 80s and 90s probably a late late 80s early 90s you would have been terrified as a child if you were a child in those times as I was by the news of this massive hole in the ozone layer you know in this uh, it was over Australia we were all going to be fried to a crisp uh, I, I was terrified as a child now interestingly we we understood that the ozone depletion was being caused by something called CFCs the Montreal Protocol was finalized in 1987 to phase out CFCs, so aerosols essentially, refrigerants, etc. We replaced them with something called HFCs, which have massive global warming potential, but fortunately do not um, destroy the ozone layer. And the Kigali update now is focused on actually reducing the HFCs that were in to replace the CFCs because we've realized the demand for refrigerants. Uh, particularly with a heating climate, if we continue to, to use HFCs, we are going to continue to, to produce incredible sort of global warming potential because, of course, carbon is not carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. HFCs are really powerful greenhouse gases as well. So slightly terrifying. But the fact is the world came together and made a decision to phase out CFCs. And we did it. And we, you know, it's yes, CFCs last in the atmosphere a long time, but the latest studies show that the ozone layer is recovering and scientists expect it to be back to 1980 levels around 2070. So this is genuine proof that we have faced a challenge like this before, an existential risk to our livelihoods, losing the ozone layer. And the world came together and made a commitment clear direction for industry, industry responded and delivered a solution. So this climate challenge in the next nine years, guys, is not beyond us, but it is going to take a conservative and focused effort by everybody 
in this virtual room, outside this virtual room. And certainly the guys up in, in, in Glasgow are going to have to make a little bit of an effort. But it's, as I say, it's not all doom and gloom. Now, the interesting thing as well, if you, you're, you're familiar with Kate Raworth's work, something called Donut Economics, Kate took those planetary systems that you can see around the outside and did something really interesting with them. She actually added in the social foundations as well. So this was saying, not only do we have to stay within our planetary systems and develop within our planetary systems, but we have to provide the fundamental basic social foundations for everybody within the planetary boundary as well. And you can see the shortfall that we've got in social foundation at the moment, political voice, uh, and that's actually getting worse. COVID has, has really sort of made the political voice. Uh, democracy is suffering with, with COVID, but you'll see things like education, housing, energy, water, food. Some of these problems that were in the Millennium Develop Development Goals around hunger, around sanitation, around fresh water, they're still a challenge to us. And I think it's really important to realise that the world's wealthiest 10%, you may have heard this statistic, so the world's wealth, wealthiest 10% produce half the world's carbon emissions, whilst the poorest 50% are responsible for only about 10% of CO2 emissions. And everybody goes, well, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not the world's wealthiest 10%. Well, I'm sorry, guys, but I, I'm going to say that every single one of you on this call is within the world's wealthiest 10%. Anybody with a net worth of £75,000, £75,000, so if you've got a home, even if the bank owns a whole host of the home, if, you know, if the bank owns 50 or 60% of your home, I dare say you have a net worth of around £75,000. So we are responsible. It is us. There is no them in this discussion. So, you know, and if you have a look at it as well, we know that buildings, infrastructure and, of course, aggregates are going to be absolutely critical to supporting all people and countries across the globe in delivering those basic social foundations, healthcare, energy infrastructure, shelter, water, wastewater services, education, etc. So essentially what that means is that we're going to have to, as a country, start consuming less to allow the rest of the world to consume more to allow them to meet their basic social foundations and needs. And it's a really sort of shift in the business model and the thinking, I think, you know, this is not endeavoring growth. If, if your business plans are based on growth, on growth, on growth, year on year on year, I would scratch your head and go back because we simply can't support that as a, as a planet anymore. You know, the, 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 the years and years of never ending growth, increasing GDP, have to be behind us we've proven that it's not a viable model within society it's not fair equitable within society and certainly the environment can't cope with that sort of idea of perpetual growth and the last one here that I'm going to just mention is the sustainable development goals I'm hoping that you guys are familiar with the SDGs these were adopted by global leaders in 2015 you might have seen them as 17 little squares and I really like this representation that I'm showing you here because basically what it says is there's earth preconditions climate life below water and life on land without those in place without a healthy ecosystem we can't hope for sustainable resource use we can't hope to meet basic human human needs we can't meet universal values so these earth preconditions are absolutely vital to achieving some of the further sustainable development goals and if you sort of see here right at the top we've got the social ec and economic development so we have to have a healthy ecosystem to deliver and support a healthy society and of course we need a healthy society to have healthy uh, socio and economic development and the other thing that i want you to notice around here the goals 16 and 17 around those is about governance and partnerships. No company, no person, no, no city, no country can do this alone. It is about breaking down those silos that exist within our industry. And they are pretty tough silos within the built environment, you know, between clients and supply supply chain partners like yourselves, whether it's between architects and engineers, um, there's these, these fundamental silos that really need to be break, broken down. Step out of the comfort zone. 
you guys aren't there just to sell ag aggregates. You guys are there to challenge and change the industry, to offer something different, to make those connections and create those relationships and provide the data that is required to create a fundamental change in the way that we deliver basic buildings and infrastructure. As I say, this is about everybody doing their bit now. So that's kind of the, you know, overview of, of where we are. Let's let's have a closer look at the built environment. It's where I've spent all of my career. I love building stuff, as I'm sure most of you guys take the pleasure out of seeing elements of, of your local communities that you've contributed to as well. There's a reason why we work in, in, in construction, right? So this is quite a sort of a, a nice, I'm not going to go into the detail, the difference between energy and emissions, Kilowatt hours versus tons of carbon, basically, is what we're talking about here. I'm going to focus on carbon for the moment because that's what we're all uh, sort of focused on. And you'll see on the right hand side, if you have a look at the building and construction share, if you like, it's saying that buildings and construction have about 37% of the global share of CO2 emissions. And you can see here residential, non residential, direct and indirect. So the direct is the direct burning of fossil fuels like gas for our central heating systems, for our hot water. Let's not talk into the ridiculousness of hydrogen and the, uh, and the government's hydrogen strategy for, for providing hydrogen for heating of homes. Leave it for the concrete guys. The concrete guys, the cement manufacturers, are the guys that need the hydrogen as well as the steel manufacturers. So we should put our hydrogen there. Not saying any more about that because it will be another hour onto this discussion. But then I guess the interesting bit for, for us is this 10% in the building's construction industry and a further 10% in other construction so infrastructure delivery if you like so we've got quite a lot of what we call upfront emissions those are the embodied carbon if you like of, of the construction products and services that, that, that we're providing and that's kind of where you guys fit so that's 20 percent of global co2 global co2 emissions the reason why it's quite interesting to talk about the energy side of things is that often we sort of go to renewable energy and we think well we'll continue consuming kilowatt hours willy-nilly and we'll just invest in some pvs but we know that in order to get to a net zero carbon society we actually have to reduce our consumption of energy kilowatt hours as well as secondary to if you like the secondary step if you like is investing in renewable technology we can't possibly get to a net zero society if we continue to consume energy in the quantities that we do looking at forward growth and a point you know on, on equity if you like so our sector must simultaneously meet a projected near doubling of the global demand for energy services in buildings and at least a doubling of the floor space as developing economies continue to respond to the growing demand for building floor space, access to energy services and economic activities. So as I said before, in order to allow the developing economies to grow and deliver a good quality of life to their people, we actually are going to have to contract and use less. It's a difficult message to deliver, but as I say, you know, we are at the stage where there's there's almost no way out of this. So if we have a look at uh, your your building products, if you like, a favourite one, I'm going to look at concrete. And again, I'm not going to go into concrete too much and the decarbonisation profile. It's another sustainable concrete is another two hour lecture. But interestingly, I, I, you guys, I hope, know this and I'm going to ask you to put your messages in, in chat as I go through this slide. Concrete is the most consumed resource on earth, second only to one thing. And I would love to know what you think you are second to in terms of consumption. If you type away in the chat and I'll continue talking, I'll come back to it to see how many of you have switched on. Oh, you've already spoiled it for me, David, Dave and Gary. Oh, no, Gary went for meat. Okay, David, David and Lyle. They're right. It's water. <laughs> they were first in. Well done, guys. A lot of a lot of people think that it's oh, sometimes they think it's fossil fuels, oil, gas and, and that sort of stuff. Meat is an interesting one, Gary. And uh, we might uh, come back to sort of timber or, or forestry products, if you like, is where I'd sort of put meat. And certainly in terms of contribution to CO2. You might be 
along the right lines. I was looking for the most consumed resource, but the contribution to CO2, I'd have to double check what the what the meat industry contributes because the cement industry or the concrete industry contributes around 8% of global CO2 emissions. Now, concrete, as you guys, I hope, know, is approximately 15% cement by mass, but the cement accounts for about 90% of the carbon footprint. So you guys could turn around to me and say, well, we're doing, ash we're doing asphalt, we're doing aggregates, it's a problem of cement. It's not our problem. Yes, but as we discussed earlier, we are now at that critical tipping point. Taken away from the fact that most of the companies you work for will be involved in aggregates, asphalt and concrete and cement for reduction, the whole lot. But the point is, you know, the last couple of decades of talk and no action has led us to this point. And all businesses, all people need to take action now to halve absolute carbon emissions by 2030 and this is a really interesting one in terms of absolute carbon emissions because you see a lot of people talking about carbon intensity of their products so if you were to say to me well I'm going to halve the carbon intensity of every ton of aggregate I pull out of the ground but I'm going to triple the amount of aggregates I pull out of the ground I'm going to scratch my head and go well hang on a sec we're going the wrong way guys and a lot of people a lot of net zero carbon strategies are actually based on a reduction in carbon intensity rather than a reduction in the absolute carbon. And as we say, it's all hands on deck now. It's that carbon budget. So if you do still foresee growth in the aggregates industry, it's not just about reducing the carbon intensity. You have to try even harder and reduce the carbon intensity to such a point that you can accommodate further production and quarrying of aggregates within your carbon budget uh, so it's going to be a double whammy for you to get there i'm talking away but hopefully i will just about hit my time guys let's have a look you know as we say it's not just about carbon either i, I saw a great graphic recently that sort of said it you know this this was the carbon the, the carbon blinkers there is all of this other stuff around the biodiversity the resource consumption the water consumption etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not just about carbon this is a really interesting graphic this is global resource production. I think what surprised me actually was the was the contribution of non-metallic minerals. And of those non-metallic metallic minerals, actually construction is responsible for about 98% of the mineral extraction that we're seeing. So not only do non-metallic -metall minerals make up the, the vast majority or a significant proportion, let's say, sorry, significant proportion of all of the resources that we're extracting globally, but construction products and particularly things like aggregates make up the vast majority of that meat and mi mineral extraction as well. We've got clays, kaolin, chemicals and fertilizer mineral minerals that make up the residual. Now, if historic trends of increasing resource consumption continue, what the, the little yellow triangles show, show you is that by 2060, we'll be extracting over 190 billion tons of materials with non-metallic minerals making up almost 60% of that. Interestingly, only 20% will be metals and fossil fuels together. Those of you age old business, business guys might be rubbing their hands and sort of saying, wow, look at all that growth. But as we said, we've got to figure out a smart way of doing this because we can't simply just continue to extract in the realms that we already have. And if you need convincing mineral resource extraction, the little red pie charts that you see, mineral resource extraction is responsible for 90% of biodiversity loss, 90% of water stress. Now, I know quarried products in the UK have generally a great reputation for biodiversity reinstatement, but can we afford temporary losses in nature anymore? Can we afford further land take, even if we are going to re reprovide it further down the line? What about water abstraction in use? How does your water consumption fit the water deficits and investment plans in your local region. If you haven't had a look at the AMP7, AMP7, the asset management plans of the water companies, I suggest you do, because you might find that your quarries are in quite a water stressed area. And it's going to be a case of either there's a hose pipe ban and restrictions on water for the general population, or there's restrictions on water abstraction for industry. And that's going to be a really challenging a decision for local governments to take and you know direction for local governments to take so i think building s is going to be part of the solution and you'll hopefully have seen increasing calls to facilitate building refurbishment at the moment we pay vat on building refurb but we don't pay vot if we knock something down and rebuild it 
absolute nonsense. This is craziness. So there's a huge pressure and a huge drive to reverse those bizarre incentives so that we are maintaining we're reusing the concrete foundations and slab that are in the ground. We're reusing the concrete flame. This is what the concrete industry always tells us. Concrete's a great material because it's so durable. Yet we knock it down when it's still good. <laughs> you know, um, so, so there does really need to be this pressure on innovative refurbishment of buildings and keeping the concrete in the ground reusing the concrete frame, reusing the concrete foundations and giving it a second lease of life. It's complete nonsense to think we break it, we knock it down. You guys will tell me, oh yeah, but it's great, we recycle it. No, you don't, you downcycle it. You take concrete at what, 100 quid a ton and turn it into aggregate that costs about 10 quid a ton. You're losing value and you're losing a similar amount of carbon when you turn concrete into aggregate as well. We are not recycling concrete. We are deep down cycling concrete. And that is a problem. The only way to really, I see, to recycle concrete, there is some interesting stuff going on in Holland. But realistically, the only, the only way, there is no easy way to recycle, genuinely recycle concrete. We need to reuse it. We need to keep those foundations and frames. And interestingly, if you have a look at carbon footprint of buildings, the embodied carbon of buildings, we often found about 60% of the embodied carbon is indeed in those foundation and frames. So, you know, it, it solves the double whammy of a problem in terms of resource extraction and embodied carbon. I think uh, manufacturing more efficiently will also be part of the solution, reducing waste byproducts. From the stats that I see from the QPA, it's about 3%. Of, of waste for the aggregates industry, of which the vast majority is used in site restoration. We still produce about 350 tons, thousand tons of waste sent, uh, which is sent for recycling, and maybe another 18,000 tons sent to, to landfill. So it's not massive. You, you quite the quarrying industry is quite efficient, but that doesn't mean that we sort of sit on our resort, on our haunches and, and don't really try and tackle these last bits of waste or, or create high value aggregates. And I think maximizing the value of construction, demolition and excavation waste to, to genuinely substitute primary materials is, is going to be of importance as well. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that next. So where next for quarried products? First thing to say, it, don't forget about externalities. And I'm hoping that you guys have an idea as to what externalities are. Externalities are essentially the stuff that we don't pay for. We have historically used the environment as a free dumping ground. Emissions to air, dust, noise, carbon dioxide, water, ground. Yes, there's controls in the UK, but we don't fundamentally pay the genuine cost. It's, a, it's the failure of the common sort of thing. It's a common resource, so it's managed communally. And we don't necessarily really sort of take into the balance sheet the, the, the cost associated with the emissions to air Obviously, if you're going to be prosecuted, then they might. Something shocking that I heard recently was that actually wastewater companies are finding it cheaper to dump raw sewage into rivers and pay the fines than it is actually to treat the sewage. So there's a complete disconnect here associated with environmental fines and actually what the genuine cost is to the environment, what the genuine cost is um, to businesses, etc. So. If we think about big one here, if you like, I think that often comes with quarried product is deliveries. And I'm going to give you an example uh, using some data from DB Schenker on the London Olympic Park. Brian, your time with Aggregate Industries, you, you might recognize some of these numbers. I probably bugged you for, for data at, <laughs> at some point to, to, to help out with this. One of the interesting things around the Olympic Park was the rail, the, the rail head and the rail deliveries. And you can see that, you know, 95% of raw materials for concrete, 90% of loose aggregates, curb stones. So a lot of your concrete products, your, your, your tiles, plasterboard, soils most of that stuff was brought to site or taken away from site by the on-site railhead. Now, what does that mean in terms of externalities? The Department for Transport has a really good data set. It's a little bit old now, but it's still being used for what they call freight modal shift. So if you want to take trucks off the road, there is a grant available if you choose to put them on rail, if you develop a rail or a, a barge solution. And the interesting thing about this grant is that the calculation encourages you or requires you to look at externalities. So what are the externalities of HGVs? Consider the cost to society, loss of GDP due to 
congestion. The cost of health services due to poor health, whether that's noise leading to depression, whether it's air quality, whether it's accidents. Th these are all services that we pay for. But when you have your delivery driver going from A to B and it's HGV, you're paying for the cost of the truck, you're paying for the cost of the diesel, you're paying for the driver's time. You're not paying for all of these externalities. There is a little bit of taxation, but if you choose to go and have a look at the freight modal shift grant, you'll see that the taxation is a drop in the ocean compared to what the socioeconomic costs are associated with HGV movements around, particularly around air quality and noise. The numbers that we did, 3 million tonnes of materials, 20,000 tonnes of CO2, about 280,000 road vehicle movements, and £10 million pounds worth of externalities. So whatever it cost us to invest in that railhead, whatever it cost us to, to, to use rail delivery rather than HGVs, it was an overall investment in terms of uh, the socioeconomic development of, of the UK. And I think this is a really interesting way to start looking at things. One thing that I will ask to you guys is what is actually the socioeconomic cost of externalities at the quarry sites? You know, I have a look at some of the complaints that have received and a lot of these are about noise. They are about dust. They are about traffic. Are we just recording the complaints or are we genuinely understanding and putting in our balance sheets when we're investing in new tech that could reduce water consumption, that could reduce dust production, that could reduce noise? Are we actually quantifying the socioeconomic costs within our balance sheet? And maybe we should, because it could actually tip the investment solution to something that's a, a bit more sustainable, if you like. Picking up on the sort of the idea of reduction of waste and maximizing the value of recycled materials. For those of you that are familiar with BRIAM, you may have noticed that the 2018 criteria for aggregates, the waste O2 change, that was our fault. We got quite frustrated about the fact that Waste O2 was saying recycled and secondary aggregates are good, regardless of where you are in the country, regardless of where your project is, regardless of where the aggregates come from, recycled and secondary aggregates are good, everything else is bad. And actually, Brian was also trying to push aggregates up the value chain as well. So they were requiring you to put recycled and secondary aggregates into concrete and everybody went to stent because that was the only secondary aggregate that people could figure out how to put in, into concrete. Now, the BRIAM 2018 has a much broader consideration around resource availability, where you are in the country, what resources are, are, are available. And that's looked used as sort of a material flow analysis for hard rock quarries, for sands and gravels, for marine dredged, etc. It has a look at, looks at transportation, rail, barge, roads, and of course it looks at carbon as well. So there's a much more rounded discussion in terms of sustainability of aggregates and what sustainable aggregate sourcing looks like. We presented a clear argument to the BRE, which was a case of why push recycled materials up the value chain while we're still using primary aggregates for construction fill and low value construction uses. And you can see in these numbers, I did the 2019 numbers this morning, and um, we are still putting a lot of primary aggregates into what I would consider low value uses. I, I think the industry needs to tackle this. We need to drive towards an economy that only uses primary aggregates for critical uses, high performing concrete, road surfacing perhaps, the UK is already a leader in reprocessing construction, demolition and excavation waste to make. So to make aggregates circular, if you like, we need to reduce that consumption. We are consuming too much for the construction and demolition waste that we're producing. We're putting primary aggregates into their low value uses. I think the whole system fundamentally needs to change and really needs to tackle. So I get, you know, part of the discussion has to be what alternatives are out there. If it's not aggregates, what is it? We're seeing the Dutch uh, really explore plastics in roads. There, there's some research happening in Japan about waste products going into concrete, stuff other than aggregates, slightly terrifying. Uh, and I've seen, I noticed there's some, some investment in, in Hansen uh, facility in 2015, which was designed to facilitate 10 mil stone recovery from their Watley quarry. All of these sorts of investments are a no brainer, but they're not going to get us to a circular economy within the aggregates industry in the UK. So we do need to start reducing the demand and considering how we're, we're using um, those aggregates that we do have the primary aggregates more, more sustainably, I guess. Next one, I'm just going to sort of make a comment here because this is quite familiar to many of us. You guys, the aggregates industry, 
we have a real problem. Like the rest of the construction industry, we have a real problem with an aging workforce, with a lack of a diverse workforce. And this is all part of sustainability and really sort of tackling that issue around equality, diversity, being representative of the communities that you actually work in and work for is, is of growing report importance. And the aggregate industries is far, is far from represented. We need data and transparency. Some of these numbers, I'll just take a couple of minutes to talk you through this because I found this really interesting. And James and I had a bit of a chat about this last week. And I sort of said, you know, what number is it? Everybody tells me the magic number is four kilograms of CO2 per tonne of aggregates. And certainly, actually, if you have a look at the Mineral Products Association, uh, the Institute of Quarrying, they tell me that crushed rock, land, base, sand and gravel is actually below four these days it's around three or, or even lower for the for the land-based sand and gravel yet if I have a look at environmental product declarations from aggregate industries and from tarmac you can see where the blue dots lie and they're much much higher than what the what the industry as a whole is reporting so my challenge to you guys is what number is it where are you expending this carbon in what processes what is the right number is it three or is it five if we have a look at the sea base, we've got BMAPA telling us that land, um, sea base gravels are quite high at seven. Britannia, who run one of the oldest ships in our marine uh, industry, you can see is actually delivering aggregates lower than what BMAPA is telling us. I've run out of time, so I'm not going to uh, go through the, the tool, but there's some. Britannia have invested in a tool that allows every their skipper to record every journey, each part of their journey allows them to interrogate the efficiency of uh, dredging, the efficiency of offloading, the efficiency of each cycle that they do. They've done some fantastic investment in data and transparency. And I think that's really, really important. Just to give a shout out to the guys at Agric Industries, not only for having their EPDs in place, which gives us a real recognition of uh, not just carbon, but also a much, much wider environmental considerations I also sort of picked up that there's a new consortium with Aggregate Industries University looking at developing liquid air energy storage, energy efficiency technology. Not something that I understand, but I understand it's a complete possible, complete game changer, not only for the aggregates industry, but anybody that uses compressed air. So, you know, this sort of investment, this sort of collaboration across industries with research, et cetera, is fundamentally important to, to helping solve some of these problems around energy performance, energy consumption, et cetera. But that doesn't sort of say, it doesn't give you the excuse to get out of data. If we don't have, you know, great setting targets, but if your data is not good enough, you know, how are you going to manage your progress? How are you going to understand your progress and your return on investments? What good, we see proliferation of data, but nobody actually goes and analyzes it. Nobody sorts it. Nobody arranges it. Nobody in interprets it. So, you know, what good is, is all of this data if we don't actually reflect, learn and improve? Data is the key to solving this. Transparency, sharing of data is absolutely critical here. So I'm going to encourage you guys to at least go away and sort of really start tackling what your, what your data is or isn't. A couple of sort of quick things I think that need to happen around collaboration. We've heard frustrations around restrictive standards. You know, high PSV stone going in all surfacing courses. Actually, it's a scarce resource. The guys know that. We should use it only when it's generally re required. There's an engagement required with local authorities. The safety of their roads are not going to be hampered if they don't have high PSV stone everywhere. We need to challenge the restricted use of recycled aggregates in adoptable roads, in, in, in concrete, etc. Facilitate a shift to warm mix asphalt. I know this is something that you guys want to do, but it's no good just asking for every project. Can we do it? Can we do it? There needs to be a genuine shift in education program across local authorities to say warm mix is the way and it's the only way moving forward. Further exploration, exploration of bitumen alternatives like the veggie coal um, colas product over in France would be great. I mentioned, you know, other waste products happening whether there's other waste products that could be used in concrete and asphalt, such as plastic roads. And you might find that somebody else is going to be the driver. If you guys don't do this, you might be playing catch up. We've been doing some work with a master developer, Urban and Civic. We've developed their roadmap to net zero. We've shown them they cannot keep delivering infrastructure and homes in the same way that they've always delivered them if they want to hit net zero. 
they have to deliver their master plans. They have to shrink their master plans. They're built environment size by 30%. They have to invest in alternatives and recycling, warm mix roads, et cetera, et cetera. But that's going to be a small part. They fundamentally have to change what they are delivering as a master developer and consider that it's not four bedroom, five bedroom family homes, that there is a different way of living. There's a different way of providing housing and homes. They are looking at collaborating with their house builders. They are going to be looking at collaborating with their supply chain partners. And we're seeing more and more of this come forward from, from those sort of key clients and drivers. It's being driven by finance, green investment, ESG investing is, is on the agenda. So guys, get ahead of the curve. This is coming down. I'm going to leave the summary. We've got four critical that we act now. I think I've got that across now. Do something. It's not just about carbon intensity. There is a carbon in budget. We need to look at um, alternatives to reduce the quantity of primary materials we're extracting to reduce those socioeconomic impacts. And the focus, we really need to sharpen our focus. You know, we can't we can't just keep business as usual. Uh, James, I'm really sorry. I've done my usual. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop sharing. And That's give okay. It back to you. Thanks, thanks, Kirsten. I think, um, look, understandable. It's great a to see your passion of the subject, but also your depth of knowledge there. So, and just just before we go to Martin and Brian, um, we are recording this. So I know some people may be having to drop off for, for other meetings uh, fairly soon, um, but we have got the recording and it'll be made available online, obviously after after the event. So, without further ado, perhaps if I hand over to um, Brian first, just to get some some thoughts and responses from yourself. Um, and if we have got time for questions at the end, we'll uh, we'll pick up on those. Thanks, Ken. As usual, always thought provoking and, and just shows the enormity of, of the challenge that we've got ahead. I think part of what you've said is, is absolutely true about the um, measuring of the the um, of what is net zero. I think everybody uses a slightly different form, and that and that's the problem. We need a common approach. One of the one of the major clients you mentioned as well about uh, clients led specifications. I think they're just waking up to the fact that they've got to start doing this. Road uh, clause nine hundred eight now for the strategic road network specification says that warm mix is now permitted and is preferred in most cases over hot rolled asphalt. But then, what does hot, what what does warm mix look like? Are we doing that correctly? That's the thing. You know, we need to get get some some research done on, on what is the best some of them you know it, sustainability as well in, in materials is making it last longer you know we should be looking at longer life binders as, as well as um just the, um what what we're doing with them so alternative aggregates what what do we use in our plant you know plant technology how can we make that more efficient it, there's a whole raft of things we should be looking at not just you know Oh yeah, we'll we'll try and minimise a bit of carbon here and there. It isn't. It's as you say. It's the whole front end to back end, cradle to grave, everything in there. And let's not underestimate the logistics. You know, how many times do we see trucks passing each other, going backwards and forwards when they're going, you know, taking planings one way and and ash out the other? When you know, there's recycling things on site. You know, the, what we're we looking at these things for. So. Yeah, lots of good stuff in there. And I think the idea of, of partnering and working together has got to be, in, within the supply chain, has got to be one of the key areas for the future. Because you know, no more is, is innovation going to be you know, going to be sort of focused on one thing. It, it has to be out there in, in the industry. So thank you. I, yeah, that's very good today. I, I really found it very interesting. Thanks, Brian. Uh, just a quick comment on the net zero standard that is shared across the industry. Um, there is a past standard for carbon neutrality. Carbon neutral is not the same thing as net zero. Um, yes. there, are, there are slight definitions, but the science-based targets initiative, SBTI, are probably the best that we have at the moment around net zero carbon. And they just last week ahead of COP have published a clear standard proposed standard for quantifying um, and claiming net zero so that's starting to come it's a it's a huge call on cop 26 as well to have global standards around net zero but for anybody tackling the net zero challenge now 
go to science-based targets, download their new standards. It will take a few readings to get your head around. Um, and it's not, you know, there's still a few sort of interpretations and uncertainties, but it's, a, it's definitely the place to start. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, for that. And I'll uh, hand over to Martin and, uh, to, to get your view as Institute Aquarium President, uh, Martin. Thank you, Kirsten. Great, great kickoff. I think it's that uh, yeah, the agenda you covered there. Thank you. Um, in an hour, pretty diverse and pretty striking. So, I think um, I really pick up on some of the on some of the themes. I think the, the agenda that we set out for the rest of the week, following your uh, very kind start, I think you know, points us towards, in some ways, with the action. You know, I think your your demanding, and I think you know, uh, we in the industry, I think the the greenwashing and lack of commitment hopefully is a is a thing of the past. I think that gets you through your first pass um, ESG tick. But you know, basically, when you circle back around to yeah, that's great. But what are you really going to do? And that's in a clearly what you need to demonstrate, as you said there, with, with not only data to prove that you are making improvement, but you know, the, the, the actions that you are taking effect. And I don't think we can sit back and wait for 2030 and hope there's going to be some huge technology shift. But you know, suddenly the world gets better overnight, you know, because of 2030 or, you know, some kind of way of, of uh, utilizing carbon, you know, which we don't have now. So for me, I think there's an awful lot of small steps that we, the industry, must start to take. And an awful lot of us, I guess, is almost all starting to take. And I think, you know, the, as I said, the agenda for the rest of the week is just pointing towards, I think, you know, some of the areas where specifically the, uh, the coin sector can, can start to make real progress into that uh, that absolute carbon that you talk about. You know, we're talking around uh, you know, the use of fuels in our uh, businesses and we've got the uh, technology-driven sustainable processes with um, Ian, Ian um, Omerod. We're talking later in the week around, you know, what are the alternatives to fossil fuels that we should be using? And not just, as you say, you know, changing fuels, but what can we do to be more efficient? What can we do to optimise the... Uh, the plant that we have, you know, to change out and to look at again um, energy, you know, self generation, clean energy. But again, you know, to your point, person around you know, the kilowatt hours, what are we doing to optimize uh, and reduce? And then, of course, you know, reverse the biodiversity loss. You know, what are we doing to, you know, really build out the natural solutions? As you say, that you know, perhaps more often not come at the end of a project, but actually, if you look at the whole life of, of a of a coring program, you know, we are looking to add those kind of positive gains, you know, to reverse the biodiversity losses, you know, right away through the full the full lifetime of the project. So there was an awful lot of thank you that you uh, that you challenged us with. And I was so saying when you're all uh, looking forward to your uh, credit card on those so, there was so much in there. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for really kick starting the week for us with that agenda that you've set because uh, everything that you have pointed out and I've just more than twenty here which I will pick up, you know, throughout the rest of the week, I think. You know, the industry has got a, a lot to learn. You know, we've got lots of great people that are in the industry who are leading, as you say, you know, collaboration with other industries, collaboration with, with you know, uh, other professional bodies has to be the way forward for all of us. But uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the challenge that you've set us all. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Martin. It was it was a whirlwind tour. So thanks for, for <laughs> <laughs> putting up with me. I don't have all of the... I don't have all of the answers. I don't have all of the solutions, but certainly, you know, understand some of the problems and understand the importance of, of the aggregates industry within solving some of the, 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 the clients issues as well. You pay it, but you do play a critical role. So looking forward to hearing more from the aggregates industry um, as, as we move forward, really. We've only got eight short years. Uh <laughs> I remember when 2020 was a long way off, unfortunately, in my age, so. <laughs> brilliant well i'm conscious we've overrun a little bit of time and i know people are beginning to sort of uh, get back to their day jobs kirsten brian martin thanks for your time today and kirsten i think probably this is the hopefully the start of a dialogue i think you've covered a huge amount of of ground as everybody said today and there's probably a lot of questions that come out of this but quite a lot of thinking for us to do and, and go away and take back 
take back and come back with probably further questions over over the coming months and years because I think uh, clearly it's it's a huge agenda for us all and it, and it would be great to perhaps sort of uh, keep the dialogue with yourself particularly going from a from from our perspective to be able to sort of touch base now and again in the future and and sort of see how we're getting on hopefully in this ambitious sort of push to where we want to be in seven years time. And I think if we can facilitate, you know, we do have master developers and uh, estate developers um, as our clients. They are wanting to push the boundaries. They are wanting to do something different. Sometimes it's just a matter of understanding, getting hold of what is the investment? What does it mean? Um, So I I think, you know, there is an opportunity there to be a conduit um, if we can facilitate in that way. Me and my team are always looking for the for good ideas and, and intelligent opportunities. Um, I know there was a comment about um, Lyle made about the um, adequate maintenance. You know, let's have that debate. Let's have that discussion when we're putting a road down. Let's make sure that um, the the local authorities do understand the maintenance requirements, et cetera. Um, So, James, I would welcome uh, the the ongoing dialogue. It's it's these sorts of connections that really make the difference, I think, in terms of that collaboration and, and changing things, fundamentally changing things the way we do things. So, Fantastic. yeah, thank you for the invite, James. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everybody for your attendance. And uh, hopefully we'll see you over the next few days in, in the following up sessions that we've got across the week. And uh, thank you very much and take care. Oh.